When I did my PhD, uh, a lot of it I did at a place called uh, the Dersbury Synchrotron, just outside Warrington, which in turn is just outside Liverpool, rather further north of here. And Dersbury was the first synchrotron of its kind that was built to actually use the light. All the other synchrotrons before that were actually parasitic in the sense that particle physicists had built them. They really hate the fact that they're losing energy from the particles due to this light. Dersby was the first place, and it was great that it was in the UK, where a synchrotron, a dedicated synchrotron was built. That was called a second generation synchrotron. Diamond is something called a third generation synchrotron, where as well as the ring, which accelerates the, particle, the electrons around, we also have these wonderful things, which are called undulators and wigglers. And what they are are periodic arrays of magnets. Let me put this down. So you've got north, south, north, south, no, sorry, north, south, north, south, south, north, north, south, south, north, etc. Skipping around. And what that will do is it will bend the electrons even more. So when the electrons are going through, they'll be following this very, very, very curved path. And by doing that, what happens is you can even improve the brightness. You can get more and more light out of the um, particles. And what's really remarkable, and I can't let this video go by without seeing this, is that it's a wonderful example of relativity in action because when they design these things, these undulators, in terms of the period of the magnets, they have to take into account the fact that the electrons are traveling so very close to the speed of light and they will see due to something called Lorentz contraction, and Brady has made many videos about this in the past, due to something called Lorentz contraction, they, the electrons see a very different period for those magnets than we do. You've got like six or seven days here. How much do you feel like you're against the clock and time is precious? All the time and generally it only ever works on the last two days. That's exactly what happened last time. We spent so much time trying to get the bloody molecules down, plastered everything but the sample with the molecules. My experience um, in terms of, of synchrotron time, and I've done, done this for quite a number of years, um, took a break from it for some time and then came back to synchrotrons, but you're always against the clock, always, always against the clock. And the, the, the troublesome thing with synchrotron time, I find, or any of these, these times at large facilities, is if you're in the lab at home and you do an experiment and you come up and you're analysing it and you think you've got everything and then you find, oh no, we should have done this. In the lab at home, you can go back down and repeat that. Here, it might be six months, a year, 18 months before you get the beam time. And then you're in this incredibly frustrating position of, I just need that part of the parameter space. That's really frustrating. And that's one of the reasons why I sort of um, put synchrotron stuff to one side for a number of years. The great thing about Diamond is that the beam line staff are so absolutely wonderful. Um, they, they really go that extra mile in terms of helping us out, in terms of if we've got a particular measurement we'd like to do. Or last time, for example, we had lots of problems with beam damage in terms of the x-rays damage, they've got experience of that so they can help us out with that. But the, you rely very heavily, not just on your own team, who have got their, all their own types of different expertise, and, um, but you rely, it's a real partnership and a collaboration. And you know, when we publish a paper, the beamline scientists will go on that paper because they have to go on that paper because without them, we can't do the experiments. But it feels like so much of doing experimental science is trying it, seeing what worked and what didn't work, making little tweaks, changing your experiment, changing your machine. You haven't got the time for that sort of thing. Yet. Exactly, and that can be deeply frustrating. That's exactly it. You have to plan and plan and plan, particularly for synchrotron time, for beam time, or beam time at any major facility. You have to put in a huge amount of planning uh, in terms of just what you're going to do. And then the problem is that might all go to pot if some element of the experiment goes down. So. The great thing is when it works, particularly with a uh, source like Diamond, you've got so much light that you can really do the measurement very, very quickly. And for example, in my case, when I was doing my PhD, um, I had about a chapter and a half. I really needed three chapters worth of results all the way up to the last two months of my PhD. I was beyond panicking and we had two weeks beam time and in that two weeks beam time for a change, everything worked. Without that beam time, I wouldn't have got a PhD. There's a, a um, hotel on site, on the, on the Diamond site. So we, um, we sleep here, we spend an awful lot of time at the, the beam line. We tend to work in shifts. It takes a little bit for those shifts to kick in. It's 24 hours beam time, so you have to make as much use of it. So, you know, sometimes people, I don't advise this, but people have been known to work 36, 40 hour shifts. Quite how productive you are coming to the end of that. But, you know, again, if you've got to get this data for your thesis, uh, you've got to get this data because you need it to get the next round of funding you'll do things like that. It's a, no, it's certainly a highlight. 
Would our complete research fall to the ground if we didn't do this? No, because it complements what we're doing. But on the other hand, it gives us complementary information that we cannot, so we're our technique of choice. In, in the group in Nottingham is scanning probe microscopy. So we take a sharp probe, bring it in, move it back and forth. The problem with that technique is it gives you some information and it gives you a wealth of information in terms of being able to see the molecules. But for example, in many cases, you don't have a clue what the actual, you know, are you looking at a carbon atom? Are you looking at a silicon atom? Are you looking at a silver atom? Other than the fact that you've got a carbon sample or a silicon sample. You don't get any specific chemical information generally from scanning probes. Whereas with this, it's the other extreme. You've got none of the microscopy. You can't see the atoms or the molecules. All you get is a chemical signature, but that chemical signature is incredibly important. Put the two things together, you get the full picture or as much, a great deal more of the picture. Who's pulling the lever says, well, the train obviously didn't get smashed because it was shorter than the tunnel, so that was fine. The guy in the train sees something completely different in that what he says is that actually what happened is the train was approaching before it went right through the tunnel, the front guillotine came down and went back up again. Then after it had pretty much passed through, the back guillotine came down and back up again. And so actually the, they kind of missed the train as it